All right, tonight, our panelists of historians and museum professionals from across Lambton County will be sharing an assortment of events from a variety of different locations. We will explore unusual artifacts, paranormal stories, cemeteries, and more. If you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the chat box to make comments, share your own unexplained stories, and talk with other attendees. Just be sure that you're sending your messages to all attendees and not just panelists. Um, that's if you like everybody to see it. So you can start the chat off, which I see some people have by sharing where you're from. It's always fascinating to see how far our reach can get both inside and outside of Ontario. Okay, so tonight's presentation will be about an hour long and I'll be introducing each presenter as we go. Uh, we'll finish with a Q&A and some updates from our community museums. I'm so grateful for our panelists who have joined us tonight and continue to share their knowledge and provide great programming with the community. If you love the presentation tonight, keep your eyes peeled to register for future Heritage Hour talks as they are announced in the upcoming 2022 year. So let's begin. First up, we have Dana Thorne. Dana is the Curator Supervisor at the Lambton Heritage Museum. She previously worked as the archivist at the Lambton County Archives. Take it away, Dana. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, thanks to everyone who is here tonight. It's wonderful to see such a great turnout. I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my slides. Okay, there we go. Um, if you haven't had a chance to visit uh, Lambton Heritage Museum before, um, we're located about five minutes south of Grand Bend, uh, right across the street from Pinery Provincial Park. So if you haven't had a chance to come, uh, make sure that you come and visit. My, my talk tonight isn't quite focused on the paranormal, but I'm going to be looking at some of the things we go through here on Earth right before we pass into the next world. I'll be looking at Victorian mourning practices and then some of the artifacts in our collection that relate to death and burials. Undoubtedly, the most famous mourner of the Victorian age was Queen Victoria herself. You can see Queen Victoria's portrait in one of the historic buildings from our museum here, the Rokeby School. A uh, detail of the portrait is on the left, and you can see it hanging above the middle of the chalkboard. Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, died suddenly on December 1861, and his death had a deep effect on her. Queen Victoria wrote to her daughter, Victoria, shortly after her death, How I, who leaned on him for all and everything, without whom I did nothing, moved not a finger, arranged not a print or photograph, didn't put on a gown or bonnet if he didn't approve it. How shall I go on to live, to move, to help myself in difficult moments? Um, she sounds a little sounds a little pitiful there, actually. Uh, apparently, she remained secluded for many years after this and rarely made public appearances. Even after she began to reintegrate herself with society, she stayed in black mourning clothes for the next 40 years of her life until she died. Queen Victoria set the tone for mourning in Britain in the second half of the 19th century. And there was a huge list of rules and regulations regarding death, burials, and mourning. There were a variety of distinct mourning periods, and the length of time would depend on your relationship with the deceased, so how long you had to be in each different mourning period. Uh, apparently, women were expected to be in deep mourning for two years after the death of their husband. Here are several examples of women's mourning dresses from the late 19th century. In Collier's Encyclopedia, published in 1901, the author wrote, in times of mourning, it seems doubly hard to arouse ourselves and allow the question of what to wear to introduce itself. It is, however, necessary. Custom decrees, if even inclination does not prompt us, to show in some outward degree our respect for the dead by wearing the usual black. It will be as well to consider in succession the different degrees of mourning and their duration. The widow's is the deepest mourning of all. Whatever the material that the mourner wears, it is trimmed with crepe. The skirt, which is generally cut plain and slightly trained, is completely covered, put on quite plainly in one piece. The body and sleeves are also trimmed with crepe. The dress, in fact, presenting the appearance of one of crepe. The body can be cut according to the prevailing style. Uh, crepe is a hard gauze-like fabric with a crimped appearance. It was associated with mourning because it didn't combine well with other clothing and had a matte surface with no luster. 
It was horrible to wear for many reasons. Uh, the traditional widow's veil was six feet long and made of two layers of this black fabric, and it was uh, attached to a bonnet. The material made it difficult to breathe and hard to see. In 1857, a fashion magazine called the widow's veil blinding and stifling. Apparently the veil's purpose, according to a book, Manners and Social Uses, was to protect a woman while in deepest grief against the untimely gaiety of a passing stranger. We have several examples of uh, morning clothing in our museum collection. Here's a morning bonnet uh, from the museum. I provide a close-up of the flowers on the bonnet on the right side. This belonged to the donor's grandmother who lived in St. Mary's. There are many implications for the poorest Victorians uh, when confronted with morning etiquette and regulations of the times. On this page is a list from Collier's 1901 Encyclopedia of all the articles that should be purchased for proper morning attire. Beside that list is a very beautiful and very expensive morning dress from the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. It did become very expensive for Victorians to outfit themselves with the best morning clothes and your class quickly became obvious based on what clothes you could afford to wear while you were mourning. On this slide, you can see a morning pin as advertised in the Sears and Roebuck catalog in 1902. The entire affair of mourning became very expensive because each set of items was supposed to be purchased new for each death. Victorians were very suspicious, believed it was bad luck to keep any items associated with someone's death. So not only did you need to buy fancy morning clothes, you also needed to buy a brand new set of fancy morning clothes with each loss. Keep that on top of the high mortality rates from Victorian times and you had a difficult situation for many poor people. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and look at how people were transported and processed after they died. This hearse was acquired by Lambton Heritage Museum in 1984. It's quite striking and it's one of my favorite artifacts in the collection. It was manufactured in about 1890 by Sayers and Scoville in Cincinnati, Ohio. The funeral coach business was thriving at the turn of the 20th century and sharp competition helped create high standards of craftsmanship and design. Uh, 20 years after the horse-drawn hearse was built, the popularity of the car revolutionized the funeral carriage trade. Instead of wagons, hearses were built from modified cars, vans, and buses. Sayers and Scoville was able to pivot their business and continues to produce hearses today, 130 years after the company was founded. See this picture is looking inside of the hearse. Um, there's heavy black wool curtains that partially hide a small child's coffin from view. The decorative gold roses are painted around the bottom of the lid and an engraved nameplate reads, Our Darlings. The seat cushions, you can maybe see here, are uh, leather with horsehair stuffing. Under the seat, there's storage compartments with hinged doors and a finger hole at the top to open it. The back of the hearse has double doors that open out. Uh, there's a latch on one door and a spring catch on the bottom of the other. Here you can also see the scalped fringed curtains that are attached on the insides of the windows and can be pulled for privacy. There's the inside of the hearse um, with the child's coffin one more time. Another item in the museum collection related to death and mourning is this undertaker's wagon. Uh, this wagon was horse-drawn and manufactured in about 1901. It belonged to T. Stevenson, undertaker from Elsa Craig. The wagon's currently on a set of wheels, but it also had runners. You could convert the wagon to a sleigh for the tough winter months. You can see tall lanterns on both sides beside where the driver would have sat. I also tried to peek into the back to get a photograph inside. Um, you can rest assured there wasn't anything too interesting in the back of the wagon right now. The role of local funeral homes is intimately connected to death and mourning. Many funeral homes have been in the family for several generations and have close connections to the local community. In nearby Dashwood, just north of Lambton County, Harry Hoffman got his funeral license in 1934. He opened the T. Harry Hoffman and Sons Funeral Home in about 1940. The funeral home can be seen here in the top left and Harry's posing beside an antique car in the bottom right. In this earlier picture, Harry can be seen alongside fellow funeral home director, Gordon Eagleson. Note the runners on the wagon to help the horses pull them through the snow. This may have been one of the first advertisements ever taken out by Harry Hoffman in late 1939 or the beginning of 1940. Offering season's greetings to one and all, Harry notes, I wish to announce that I have purchased the funeral stock and equipment of the late Peter McIsaac. 
including the equipment of the late Daniel McIsaac of Crediton, and am now fully equipped to serve the public in times of need. This is another item that came from Harry Hoffman's funeral home. So wicker casket. Um, this was one of the items acquired by Mr. Hoffman when he took over the equipment from Peter McIsaac. It appears to be from the late 1800s or early 1900s. Wicker coffins were actually used up to the 1930s um, by policemen and coroners. During the Victorian era, wicker caskets were used in the funeral business, mostly for viewings or for transportation um, and occasionally at funerals. And this is a cooling table here. So this would have been situated um, over several large blocks of ice. The cool air of the ice would permeate up through the holes in the table and would preserve the body. These tables were used for the embalming procedure. As the holes acted as drainage uh, during the preservation and removal of liquids. The table features holes punched into an intricate floral design on the surface, as well as the name B.F. Leeson, Brockport, New York, and two patent dates in 1886 and 1891. The table has two solid legs with a support bar at the top and additional poet handle on either end that's hidden and it can um, fold up. At the top of the table, as you can see in the long picture, um, there's a metal device that's curved with two metal rods um, that can be slotted in to support the deceased person's head. And tucked inside the table is a large piece of black cloth that might have been used um, on top of the table during the embalming procedure. And here is the earliest example of the embalming system that was used by Hoffman and Sons. This item uh, consists of two large glass jars. One jar would have been filled with fluid and the other with blood. The system is known as a gravity fed embalming and the fluid would have been pumped manually by hand. It was used by Hoffman and Sons until they acquired more sophisticated equipment. And these two items are samples of clothing that the family would have purchased to bury their loved ones in. A tag on the inside of the garment and outside of the box indicates the number assigned to this outfit. Uh, this service was important for families that didn't have any appropriate attire to bury their family members. Uh, particularly families who worked in rural settings didn't always have a formal um, set of clothing for events like their, like their own burial. Thank you to everyone uh, for your time tonight and for um, checking out some of the artifacts of the Lifeson Heritage Museum. Look forward to hearing um, what the other speakers have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. So with that, I'm going to kind of share a, a short little ghost story from the Grand Bend area before our next presenter. And it's called the Moneta Menard's Ghost. Hank and Moneta Menard purchased a cottage on the banks of Lake Huron around 1950. The Menards transferred the cottage or transformed the cottage into an entertainment venue with a licensed establishment called the 3344 Room downstairs and an elegant black tie dining area upstairs. The couple enjoyed prosperity for many years until Moneta passed away in 1968. Shortly after her death, many strange things began to occur. Manetta's red rocking chair began to rock on its own and drawers would open and close and Hank's new wife and stepson were often tormented by a spirit of a white haired woman. The establishment was eventually per purchased by another proprietor and renamed Sanders on the Beach, but the spirit continued to wreak havoc. The mysterious happenings quieted down around 1994 a little ghost story to head into our next presenter, uh, who is Professor Greg Stott. Greg currently teaches history at the University College of the North out of Thompson, Manitoba. He grew up in Arcona and has published studies on Arcona, Port Franks, and Ware. Greg, thank you for joining us and please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. And can everyone see that screen? Yes. Okay, it, it's not terribly elaborate. It's a photograph taken of the Arcona Cemetery be sometime before 1923. And that's going to be the focus of my attention. I first should note that I've never really viewed cemeteries as places to be feared. Or I've never found them as particularly creepy places either, but 
Um, I grew up in a, I'll call it a cemetery kind of family where we used to tour cemeteries to look for relatives, relations, et cetera. And I've always had associations with them as, as, as um, important places to uh, of, me of collective memory and so on. But that having been said, I decided to focus my attention on the Arcona Cemetery in particular. The earliest records we have suggest the earliest burials probably occurred in the 1840s. Um, there was a published account uh, made in 1927 from the memories of Margaret uh, Eastman uh, uh, James, who remembered the first burial uh, in the cemetery. And she noted it occurred sometime in the very late 1840s or early 1850s. And her father, Nab Nadab Eastman, was summoned to tend to a poor and very sick Scottish emigrant uh, who um, was obviously ailing. By the time her father got there, however, unfortunately, the gentleman had expired. And so Mr. Eastman cr fashioned a crude casket made out of rough hewn boards. And he then uh, placed the unfortunate individual in this um, a coffin, which he then painted with a homemade uh, paint made of paste, ash, and milk. And they ate it with his son, carried the long box through the woods to the uh, uh, home to Arcona. Uh, he noted, uh, Margaret later noted that the casket was actually then mounted on a sleigh. And even though this was in the summer, because of the, uh, the uh, rough conditions of the roads, an ox draw, drawn, uh, the ox drew this uh, casket on a sleigh to the cemetery just east of the, the settlement or the village for burial. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind that cemeteries um, were very important, vital institutions within communities. Um, they are obviously a place to place the dead. Um, people, families would often, of course, erect some kind of memorial or monument to them, but they weren't necessarily the places of veneration that we sort of think of today. They weren't necessarily well kept. Um, and I've read accounts of the fact that the cemetery was simply to be a reminder to everyone that you're having a good day, but you might be next. Uh, make sure you are prepared, essentially, that you, any, any, at any moment, your turn may come. Um, and this is run home by the fact that uh, the Sarnia Observer, the Arcona correspondent for the Sarnia Observer on the 30th of May, 1884, issued a, a, a report to the paper saying, quote, some boys have done a foolish and most disgraceful act in using gravestones as targets for their shotguns and thus defacing a number of our very nice monuments. There is talk of offering a handsome reward for such that will lead to the discovery and conviction of the guilty parties. The parties that cannot respect the resting place of the dead are very far gone in diabolism. It is bad enough to throw stones through the windows of unoccupied houses, but defacing gravestones is worse." Unquote. Um, in 1889, it was, uh, a meeting was held in the village to discuss the terrible state of the cemetery. Uh, in fact, it was argued that if nothing were done, the, the existing graves would fall into complete destruction. And so a committee was struck to try and improve the cemetery ground. So we see this shift um, where there's suddenly a, an attempt to sort of preserve the grounds, beautify them, and so on. And thereafter, there are regular reports about trying to improve the cemetery grounds, uh, to beautify them and so on. And this seems to have been something that took off after, uh, after, after the, the, the shotgun incidents of the uh, 1884. Um, and this continued for quite some time. Of course, there are hundreds of people buried in the Arcona Cemetery. And like any cemetery, all of these markers remind us that there are hundreds of stories that go behind it. These are the deaths of people. And of course, uh, a cemetery particularly that goes back in many, uh, over a century or more, runs home the fact that people um, died uh, very, uh, people died at all types of ages. And of course, there are many testaments <clears throat> to young children and so on. I want to focus on one real life horror story, um, a, a, face, a case that faced a, um, one family, and, and in particular, one woman who was buried in the Arcona Cemetery. And these are the trials and tribulations faced by Martha Jane Furman Rickman, who lived from 1825 uh, to 1917. And her life was full of incredible tragedy. Um, and it was infinitely exacerbated by um, the fact that in one stage in her life, after an unimaginable loss, she was accused of willful murder. And if that weren't bad enough, she was accused of even more heinous crimes. Mrs. Rickman actually lived closer to Thedford, but the family had connections to Arcona, and this is where uh, many of the family members were buried. 
Um, in eighteen. Uh, in 1887, she came under suspicion for having poisoned her sister-in-law, Rebecca Hendricks, uh, and then her daughter-in-law, Laura Kennedy Rickman. Uh, and she had accompanied both of these women to find a cure in West Virginia in late 1886. Um, but both women took violently ill and died uh, rather unexpectedly. Suspicions were raised even further when Martha's only surviving son, Wallace Gray Rickman, died in February of 1887. Well, um, and so suddenly it seemed that this woman who was beset by these unimaginable tragedies became the target of suspicion. Um, and the fact ultimately was that um, authorities became very suspicious that so many sudden deaths should not face one family unless there was some terrible, uh, there, some, some, sc some terrible skullduggery was behind it. So what ended up happening was that authorities found it became suspicious and Mrs. Rickman was arrested at her home and taken into custody. And the remains of Mrs. Hendricks were exhumed from the Arcona Cemetery and an inquest was held. Speculation was rampant and the papers made much of the fact that there had been other premature deaths in the Rickman family, most of whom were buried in the Arcona Cemetery. Um, the family uh, had arrived in the area about 1862. People began to remember that her husband, George W. Rickman, had died in January, the, in January 1875 at the age of only 59. Uh, two years after the death of their young daughter, Sarah Jane, uh, who had been 12, the couple's eldest son, William, had died in 1876 at the age of 27, and their son-in-law, John Haskett, had died suddenly in 1879 at the age of 23, followed four days later by his own wife, Nancy Mariah Rickman, um, who had been 21. So people began to speculate, rumors flew, gossips talked, and people began to speculate that Mrs. Rickman had wished to secure for herself the entirety of her late husband's estate. Um, and the fact ultimately was by the time 1887 ended, she only had one surviving daughter, uh, Melissa Rickman Malloy and her son-in-law, Thomas Humble Malloy, who lived in Thedford. These, this couple would have four children. In the end, the autopsy conducted on Mrs. Hendricks remains confirmed that she had died of natural causes and the allegations were withdrawn. Uh, and Mrs. Rickman was ultimately freed, moved to Thedford and lived the rest of her life there until she died in 1917. Um, the fact is, it seems very likely that Mrs. Rickman was simply a victim of the realities of 19th century life. Um, much more cruelly than many other people, um, but the family seemed to have had a high propensity for tuberculosis and other types of diseases. So sadly for her, her life was ripped up. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to endure these, these horrible uh, losses, but then to be accused of having committed these um, crimes must have been incredibly horrific for this poor woman who ultimately hopefully gained a degree of um, solace in her, her final years, uh, and she lived another 30 years after the events. So um, these there are stories to be told in cemeteries, and, and this is one that um, is, is quite uh, horrific. It, it, it's far more horrific than some of the uh, horror films that we see <laughs> enacted on, in, in film and television. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Greg, for sharing that with us today. So before we head into our next presenter, Erin, I'm going to share yet another short story um, leading in, us into Enniskillen Township of a UFO sighting. Uh, so Loss Frederick Josh uh, was born in Enniskillen Township, the son of John and Mary Ann Josh. He married Jesse Murchison on August 9, 1932 in Sarnia, and the couple settled on Concession 14 of Enniskillen. In August 1952, Bloss reportedly spotted a flying saucer over his Petrolia area farm. Worried that no one would believe him, he did not mention the sighting to his family or neighbors. According to Bloss, it had a very bright light and dropped behind a clump of trees off to the west. Then it shot up again and floated towards Sarnia. When a neighbor, Howard McDonald, later located a pile of plastic and aluminum in Bloss's cornfield, Bloss decided to bring it to the Ontario Provincial Police to investigate this mysterious sighting. The wreckage was identified as a weather balloon from another field uh, near Mount Clemens, Michigan. 
The wreckage was not officially identified or removed until the October, as Bloss refused to allow anyone to drive in his cornfield until after it was harvested. So on October 30th, 1952, an article entitled Balloon, Not Flying Saucer, Lands in Lampton, appeared in the Windsor Star and featured Bloss Josh's would-be UFO encounter. A similar incident was reported by the Sarnia Observer in 1952 when an unidentified object was found by Harold near Wyoming, Ontario. So now that we're in Enniskillen Township, our next presenter, uh, Aaron D. Richard, is the curator supervisor for the Oil Museum of Canada. Prior to this, she worked in a variety of museum roles within Canada and England, including the Guelph Museums, Brant Historical Society, the Royal Collections at Windsor, the British Postal Museum, and Black Creek Pioneer Village. She holds a Master's of Museum Studies from the University of Leicester and a BA Honours in History from the University of Guelph. Take it away, Erin. Thanks very much. All right. So the focus of the Oil Museum of Canada doesn't typically lend itself to ghost stories or really creepy tales. Instead, I'm going to focus my part of the presentation on artifacts that have been collected by the international drillers as souvenirs as, as they've traveled to far off places. They often returned home with harrowing tales of encounters with wild animals, dangerous people, and dreadful diseases. These items might be benign to some, and for others, they will induce nightmares. The first artifact is a spider. So this uh, maybe isn't clear from the, the image, but the spider is big. It's called the lesser black bird eating spider or the Goliath bird eater, which is a slight misnomer as although it is big enough and can eat small birds, it rarely actually preys on birds. This tarantula is the largest type in the world by mass and was caught on the Colombian oil fields of the Tropical Oil Company in 1936. When fully extended, the lesser blackbird eating spider can have a leg span of up to 30 centimeters, that's 12 inches. It is a venomous spider with inch long fangs and when threatened, it makes a loud hissing noise and can be heard from a good distance away. Um, they do not like to eat in public, rather they like to drag their food back to their burrows and liquefy the insides of their prey before they proceed to suck it dry. So that's lovely. Next I have the skin of the Bushmaster, um, which is the largest type of venomous pit viper found in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. They can grow up to 2.5 meters or eight feet long. The largest recorded Bushmaster was 3.65 meters, that's 12 feet long. It is the longest of all vipers and the longest venomous snake in the Western hemisphere. It can weigh up to 11 pounds. The snake has sim a similar appearance to rattlesnakes and it does vibrate its tail vigorously when alarmed, but it doesn't have a rattle. The image that uh, I've included here is not um, a pit viper, but rather it's a boa constrictor and it is battling a crocodile in Venezuela. This is a snapshot from one of the international drillers. And on the back of the photograph, it's been titled Battle Royale and it informs us that the snake won this battle. This is a tiger's claw. So most likely this tiger's claw comes from Sumatra and was brought back to Lambton before 1911. A tiger's claw can be about 10 centimeters or four inches in length and are for grasping and holding onto their prey or climbing trees head first. Tigers cause the most amount of human death um, than any other mammal. A particularly notorious tigress can be found in the Guinness World Records for killing over 400 people in Nepal and India before being hunted in 1907. Thomas Collins was an international driller and he brought home uh, to Canada several items that from his time abroad working in the oil fields in North Borneo, Java and Asia. This headhunter's axe at the top here um, has tufts of human hair on it. And each tuft 
represents a victim whose head was severed. Headhunting was a cultural practice by several tribes in Borneo. It served as a social status symbol, a rite of passage for males, or proof of victory over invading forces. Collins also brought home uh, poison daggers from Southeast Asia. This one here was once owned by a Sumatran chief. And you can note on it the channels on the blade for the tidy flow of human blood. The poison is still reported to be potent to this day. Whether that's true or not, I uh, don't want to find out. And the last object I have for you today is um, this bottle of ash, which was collected from the worst volcanic disaster of the 20th century, which occurred on Martinique in the Caribbean. The volcanic activity of Mount Pili started in April of 1902, but it wasn't until May 5th that devastating activity occurred. There was a mud flow that swept down river, burning 150 people and generated three tsunamis along the coast, damaging boats and buildings. Several days later on the 8th at 8 a.m., there was a tremendous explosion and a ground hugging cloud of superheated gases and debris had temperatures of over a thousand degrees Celsius and moved at hurricane speed down the mountain to the village of St. Pierre, reaching it at 8.02 a.m. There was no time to escape. Virtually all the residents of the village, 29 to 30,000 30, people burned or suffocated. Although there were a number of people that had evacuated the city days before, famously, there are two survivors from the eruption. There's uh, Lodger Silbreus, a dock worker who survived because he had been imprisoned for assault in a poorly ventilated jail cell. He was found four days later by a rescue crew. Um, he had suffered deep burns, but was alive. His cell still stands today and has become a popular tourist attraction. And that's the photo in the middle there. That is the cell that he was imprisoned in. Um, the other famous survivor was Leon Compere Leandre, a shoemaker from St. Pierre. He lived on the outskirts of a town and although was badly burned, he also survived the initial eruption. So I'm gonna leave you tonight with a, um, my own creepy <laughs> story. I'm not great at telling ghost stories, but uh, I'll, I'll share this one with you as it was uh, told to me. Um, I'm going, so this is international driller, uh, Albert Huggard. The image on the right is his grave site in Madagascar. Albert was working in the oil fields on the island of Madagascar and in June, 1914, Albert and 22 diners were purposely poisoned. Only a couple men survived. As told, by his, uh, told to us by his grandson, Timothy Ryan, as Albert lay dying, he called out to his wife who was in Petrolia at the time. She awoke from her sleep and somehow knew that her husband had died, leaving behind her and their four children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. Those were some very uh, interesting artifacts, especially that spider. A little, little scary, not gonna lie. Um, so I'm gonna share one more short story before we head into David's talk. And this one is the Moore Hermit. So there was an individual named Josiah Clark, um, and he was known to be a recluse that lived in Moore Township in the early 1800s. His dugout on the banks of the Bear Creek, which is in the second concession of Moore, was marked by two pine trees that he brought from his childhood home. His origin and his family were unknown to the early settlers of Moore, who he often visited. It was discovered that he made pilgrimages, it, ugh, pilgrimages <laughs> to Niagara Falls, where he would stare wistfully over to New York State. He admitted to a Niagara man that his name was Joshua Sears and that he came from a wealthy Massachusetts family and a powerful relative had marooned him in the swamps of Moore. In a tragic twist of fate, Clark was poisoned during the winter of 1858 and his body was found in a lumber camp on concession six of Moore. And his true origin still remains a mystery. 
So our next presenter for the evening is David McLean. David is a retired high school history teacher who taught for 31 years and is currently a volunteer with the Forest Museum and the Plimpton, Wyoming Museum. He holds an honors BA in history from Huron College and a Bachelor of Education from Altos Teachers College. David, you can go ahead and share your screen for your presentation. Oh, you're on mute, David. Okay, there. Thank you, Nicole, and, and hello to everyone out there. And I'll share my screen in a moment, but I just want to make a little comment, an apology to Greg. During your presentation, I had to duck out for a moment because you made reference to a name that sounded familiar to me, Rickman. And I went to my family tree and looked it up and, and see Thomas Humble Malloy, her son-in-law, one of her son-in-laws was a great grand uncle of mine. So you just added a little bit of knowledge to my family tree. So, but I will report that Thomas outlived his mother-in-law by 20 years. So, <laughs> that means, so anyways here. Um, so I'll throw up my screen here if I can in a second. Okay. There we go. So Halloween is undeniably one of the days of the year most looked forward to by many children. Uh, it's a great uh, time of great fun, of course, to dress up in any manner of costume and enjoy treats handed out by the neighbors during the ritual door-to-door -door campaign, or to enjoy a Halloween party with friends. Now, it wasn't always this way. How Halloween is observed has changed greatly over time. And in my presentation, I will share with you a little about the history of Halloween, just a little bit, and show that it was once something far different from what it is today. It was indeed, um, once upon a time, a day on the calendar that the authorities greatly feared when it seemed there was much more tricking than treating. So first, a little background. I know a lot of you have heard about the history of Halloween before, so I'm not going to dive too deep into that. But Halloween, uh, which was derived from a curious but not unusual amalgam of ancient Celtic and Roman, as well as medieval Christian customs and, customs and practices, was brought to Canada thanks mainly to 19th century Irish and Scottish immigrants. Now, on the next slide here, on the right is a, a painting from 1833 by Irish artist Daniel MacLeese. And he's a gentleman in the photo on the left. Um, and this photo depicts, or sorry, the painting depicts some of the traditions brought by these immigrants. Titled Snap Apple Night, it shows a Halloween party in Blarney, Ireland in 1832 that MacLeese had attended. In the bottom right of the painting, if you can see down here, um, you can see a, a group of young people bobbing for apples. And although bobbing for apples still takes place today, for the folks in Blarney, it was more than just a source of fun. It was also believed at the time that whoever was first able to bite into an apple would be the next of the group to be married. And another version of the game uh, with the same idea could be seen in the center of the painting. Some looks like some older young people. And you can see a young man here, right here, who is attempting to snap a bite of an apple, thus the name of the painting, Snap Apple Night, uh, suspended from a string. So the game of bobbing for apples and other traditions uh, brought to Canada by pioneers were, of course, quite benign and harmless. But an examination of 19th and 20th century newspapers from Lambton County and elsewhere in Southern Ontario reveals that in addition to these customs, there were others carried out by some who preferred to behave in ways that were anything but benign or harmless. For them, there was much more emphasis placed on tricks rather than treats. So their tricking likely had its origins in an ancient Celtic festival. Uh, and I had to look up the pronunciation for this because I thought I had it right and I realized I didn't after I looked it up. It was known as Sawwin, and it was held from October 31st to November 1st, when it was believed that the souls of the dead walk the earth during the transition period between the end of the harvest season and the onset of winter. 
It was believed that unless these souls were appeased with offerings of food and drink, they would wreak havoc upon the community. So what examples of Halloween misbehavior did I come across? So quite a few actually, and again, a couple of these are from outside the area, but most of them are from Lambton County. So a Hamilton newspaper reported in 1867 on a violent attack on citizens riding in a buggy in the nearby hamlet of Mount Vernon. So I'll just read a little bit from the account from the newspaper at the time. It said on Thursday evening last, a party of reckless boys at Mount Vernon placed an obstruction in the road and lay in ambush until a wagon came up in which were Mr. and Mrs. McClellan and a Mrs. Flock. Uh, the miscreants then raised a wild shout, which alerted the horse, sorry, started the horses off on a keen run. The wagon soon came in contact with a post and the inmates were thrown violently out, all receiving severe bruises. But Mrs. McClellan had her right arm broken, received shocking cuts on the face and was so disfigured to be scarcely recognizable. The parties who committed the outrage escaped in the darkness, not waiting to render assistance to the parties who had suffered from their trick. Now, in 1879, a Sarnia paper reported on incidents in Plimpton Township that included the unhinging of gates, the hiding of farmers' plows, and reminiscent of the Mount Vernon incident I just mentioned, of obstructions placed on a local road. Now, I didn't see any word that anyone was injured as a result of the pranks. Um, in a few of the reports I read, there is evidence that the victims of the Halloween tricks were deliberately targeted. Uh, the Sarnia Observer shared in 1879 that a German immigrant in Port Huron, who the article states, quote, did not believe in the celebration of Halloween. So he must have let that be known to everyone. Anyways, he just happened to be occupying his outhouse when some boys overturned it and, quote, banged his door in until the man came out with a shotgun and fired at them. The paper noted that, quote, owing to his excitement, probably his aim was bad and none were hurt. The story leaves one assuming that the victim had anticipated trouble and made sure he was duly armed before entering his privy. Um, perhaps the most extreme case of tricking I came upon though on Halloween uh, was a very morbid stunt carried in it, out in 1885 by some medical students in Toronto. I came across quite a few stories about medical students in Toronto uh, and Halloween pranks. But anyways, in 1885, they apparently broke into the morgue at Trinity College, grabbed a cadaver. Actually, they grabbed three and left two behind and outside, I guess, but, but took one of them and strung it up out front of a local butcher shop, just near um, the parliament buildings in Toronto. Um, quite gruesome. Closer to home in uh, 1885, uh, it was reported in Sarnia that an unoccupied frame house in the first ward was turned to advantage as a bonfire by mischievous boys on Halloween. Several houses throughout the town suffered from broken windows the damage done being more than usually heavy. There was also a report I came across that an oil tank was set ablaze. Um, and in the following year, 1886, the, uh, the same paper reported that several people had their gardens badly destroyed by cattle who found an entrance by the gates being stolen and said this class of fun should be punished. So gate stealing was, was a common activity you found here to let out uh, the livestock so they would ravage the, uh, I guess, the area and people's gardens and such. So in 1890, uh, down Somber Way, there was a report of an attack on a beehive in that community. So I'll just read from the paper. Mr. John J. Brown had a hive of bees taken from his apiary Halloween night. The hive has since been found in the woods a short distance away where the bees were destroyed and the honey removed. The loss is estimated to be about $10 as the hive contained about 40 pounds of honey 
and two skips of beads recently fixed to winter over. And uh, I'm sitting here in forest right now, so we can't leave forest out of this. So in 1892, it was reported in forest um, that the boys in forest had a grand time on Halloween. One person had 100 cabbages stolen. The cows got into, I don't know what they would have done with 100 cabbages, but anyways, the cows got into several gateless gardens and played havoc. A buggy and handcart were placed on Mrs. Mr. Jones's roof and the fire buckets were made away with. Now, this photo is actually from Nebraska. Okay, so it's not from around here. I don't have a picture of the forest incident with the buggy, but this was a common trick to per put the person's buggy wagons or whatever up on top of the roof of the house. Now, the article made reference to fire buckets. I don't know if you know what fire buckets were or are, but these were typically um, in the days before uh, modern firefighting techniques, uh, homes quite often had buckets of sand or water placed nearby near the roof so they could put out any uh, sparks or whatever up on the roof of the house. All right. Now, undoubtedly, the most extreme example of Halloween violence I came across locally occurred in Arcona. And my, my colleague here, Greg, uh, again, Greg Stott, shares an account in his book on Arcona's history. So the year was 1903. And as the Wofford Guide Advocate newspaper reported, the Arcona citizenry feared the arrival of Halloween as in previous years it had, quote, been the occasion of considerable disorder and destruction of property. Um, this is a photo from Arcona. These, these folks are <laughs> in Arcona here. But so, so it had been the occasion of considerable disorder and destruction of property, and there were concerns that the local authorities were, quote, either not inclined or were powerless to preserve law and order. As it turned out, their fears were well-founded. A constable who confronted the gang on Halloween night was pelted with stones and bottles, prompting him to fire his revolver in the air as a warning. In retaliation, the mob set his horse loose from its stable and sabotaged his buggy by removing the nuts from its wheels. A writer from the village declared that, quote, the bombardment of Copenhagen, which had happened back in 1807 during the Napoleonic Wars, that the bombardment of Copenhagen could not hold a candle to the siege here on Saturday night. Now, it seems the perpetrators escaped justice from this incident, but the poor constable was made $5 poorer when he was fined for his failure to keep order in Arcona on Halloween night. So although the perpetration of tricks on Halloween would continue, it seems that by the 1920s, things were much tamer. Outhouses still got tipped, windows still were soaked, and pumpkins still got smashed. But by that time, efforts by community leaders and organizations, in particular churches, YMCA clubs, and so on, to organize Halloween parties or socials, as they were called, appears to have had some positive effect, providing a way for young people to have some fun without causing mayhem. Uh, and this photo here that I've had in my back drop here, uh, this photo shows some costume children, um, and we, we're not sure of the details in this photo, but I believe it's probably from the 1930s, maybe 1940s, uh, quite likely at Forest Public School, all right? So by the 1950s, the idea of children going door to door for trick-or-treating began to gain in popularity, and of course, has become a thoroughly entrenched part of the celebration of Halloween. So thank you, and happy Halloween to all. May you be well treated and not at all tricked. Thank you so much, David. That was great. I don't think I've ever seen a photo of a carriage on top of a house before. That would have been a very curious sight at the time. Um, so our last presenter, Kaylin, unfortunately could not make it tonight. So we will not be hearing about the paranormal investigations of the Burry House. However, I We'll take a couple minutes and we'll, we'll share just a little bit of a, an account on the Baldoon mystery. And then we will head into the, some, some announcements and the Q&A. Uh, so I'm just actually going to share my screen here. And it's so I pulled a news article, uh, or sorry, a publication that has some really great images. Um, 
of the mystery here. I'm going to pull up my notes and talk a little bit about Baldoon. So in 1929, near the village of Baldoon, uh, which is located near present day Wallaceburg, a group of girls were working in the barn of John McDonald. Rather suddenly, an overhead beam came crashing down and another beam fell, then another, and the girls retreated to the house. Shortly thereafter, a lead bullet smashed through the window and fell at their feet. At first they thought it was a careless hunter, but then it was soon followed by other projectiles coming through other windows. Uh, strangely, once the bullets went through the glass, they all seemed to drop to the floor. Stronger man manifestations followed. Stones bombarded the house, dishes rose from the table, uh, chairs and tables were turned over. The house would violently shake, sometimes off, seemingly off its foundation. And a mysterious black dog would appear and disappear. And there's even one account that it was on the roof of the house. Uh, shortly thereafter, this actually happened over a few years, but kind of leading forward a little bit, small batches of fire began to float throughout the house. Uh, blazes broke out in cloths or yeah, in clothes. Uh, closets were set on fire and the cotton batting underneath windows would often catch fire. Ultimately, uh, the McDonald family was forced to leave the farm when their house finally burnt to the ground. Uh, he ended up at a family member's house and problems still continued there. Mysterious fires would occur and um, the paranormal did not cease. By this point as well, it did become a tourist attraction and there was a note um, in one of the newspapers that there would al almost be cruises coming up the St. Clair to stop and visit the farm, John McDonald's farm. Uh, to view some of these curious sites, and it was known that it always happened later in the afternoon and evening. After John's house burned to the ground, uh, he was quite desperate and sought help of the famed Dr. Troyer of Long Point, Ontario, who was said to have the ability to read moonstones. Uh, she told John that if he used a silver bullet to shoot the stray black head goose that had been wandering his farm, his troubles would end. So he fashioned a silver bullet and hit the goose in the wing. And soon after, this older woman that lived nearby was seen with her arm in a sling. Now, most people believed that it was this neighbor uh, who was responsible for this witchery. However, this theory was never proven and no trace of human involvement was ever discovered. Uh, for more on the mystery itself, there is a lot online. Uh, the Wallaceburg Museum also has a great overview, uh, so you can check out their website to, to learn a little bit more about the specifics. But I wanted to mention that because there is also, um, in 1832, while this was all occurring, there was a news article that was published in the Kingston Chronicle regarding a shocking double murder that occurred in Baldoon on March 18th, 1832. So there was a man named Thomas Juilliard who was frantically seeking help, claiming that somebody was trying to kill him. And he noted when he was discussing in his frantic that he believed that the people of Baldoon were all cursed and that he was going to go change places. So he was at the home of a Mr. Jones um, when he took off into the forest. And after three or four hours, nobody was over, able to overtake him. And he found his way to the home of John Reynolds. Here he had repeatedly requested in, because he felt like he was going crazy, um, to be tied up and released in his moments of sanity. Uh, John Reynolds had complied. In the last time that John had untied Juilliard at his request, a fight had ensued and both men were injured. During the fight, uh, Mr. Reynolds grabbed a knife and ended up killing Juilliard. Later, a mortally wounded Reynolds um, also passed away um, because before Reynolds could kill Juilliard, Juilliard had stabbed him mortally multiple times. Uh, so John Reynolds, before he succumbed to his wounds later in the afternoon that same day, uh, he shared a detailed account of the events that transpired, and it all ended up in what was the Sandwich newspaper at the time and then reprinted in the Kingston Chronicle uh, next month later. 
So that kind of wraps up um, our speakers for the evening. Now, before addressing questions, I'm gonna provide a few updates from our community museums across Lambton County. So this upcoming Tuesday, October 26th at 7 p.m., the Lambton County Archives will once again host a property workshop for those interested in learning how to research a property online. Uh, details and registration can be found at www.lamptonarchives.ca. On November 9th at noon, join the Lambton County Archives with Lambton Libraries as we explore local military heritage um, through the Library and Archives Canada databases. Discover how to search information in World War I, World War II, and the War Bride databases, including how these resources can help inform genealogical and local history research. You can learn more at lclibrary.ca. The Oil Museum of Canada remains closed at this time due to ongoing renovation project undertaken this year, but staff have been working hard behind the scenes. Along with the virtual programming created for school groups, OMC has developed a list of live sessions for adult and senior groups. These programs invite a museum expert to your virtual group gathering to present one of our programs and provoke discussion with participants. Growing up does not eliminate the thirst for lot, knowledge, new experiences, or lively conversations. On November 18th at 7 p.m., join the Lambton County Archives with the Oil Museum of Canada for the virtual talk, Early Settlement in Enniskillen Township, and learn more about the early colonial settlement of this region. Following the survey of Enniskillen Township in the 1830s, we will be looking through documents in the Lambton County Archives collection, along with local township papers to uncover personal accounts of living in Enniskillen Township prior to the oil boom in Oil Springs. Moore Museum is open through the fall for self-guided tours, Monday through Friday, 9 to 4 p.m. Event dates are set for 2022, so stay tuned to the Moore Museum website as these will be announced soon. Lambton Heritage Museum is offering virtual live sessions for their holiday programs this year. Reach out at heritage.museum at county-lampton.on.ca if you're a teacher and interested in having LHM appear virtually in your classroom for this holiday season. Get in the holiday spirit with a guided tour through Somber Museum's 140-year-old Victorian home. We are showcasing all of their creepiest artifacts, turning out the lights and focusing tour information on topics like witchcraft, funerals, Victorian medical practices, and more. Note, it is a creepy guided tour with an eerie atmosphere, but it's not a haunted house with jump scares. So all ages are welcome. And for young children, they will be turning on the lights and focusing the tour on less scary topics. Tours will be available 6 to 9 p.m. October 27th to 30th with the last available start time at 8.30 p.m. Summer Museum is once again selling fall and Halloween DIY craft kits for adults and children filled with crafts, games, activities for children and featuring a rustic stuffed pumpkin table decoration and activities for older crafters. See sombermuseumshop.square.net for details and to purchase tickets for the Halloween haunted house events and craft kits. Uh, follow at Sombra Museum on social media for updates and details on their Christmas festive season. Uh, lastly, the Forest Museum is participating in the Forest Legion craft sale Saturday, November 27th from 9 to 2 p.m. Details will be on their Facebook page shortly. Everyone is also invited to attend the Forest Fall Film Festival at the Canetto Theatre. Please see the Forest Museum Facebook page for all of the details. Now, um, if you have any other questions, I don't see many that have come through for this presentation. Um, please feel free to share them now. Um, please feel free also if you have some unique stories yourself that you'd like to share in the chat. Um, we love to hear them. And I uh, will give a couple minutes here just for some Q&A. Uh, so if you do have any, please let us know. Actually, there is one in the chat. Do you think that, um, will any of you be doing any other event on paranormal findings, like say skits, the Imperial Theater, Art Museum, or other haunted places? I, I do know, oh, sorry. I do know, and I don't have the date right now. I know it's coming up near the end of the month. Um, the uh, drama. Uh, classes at North Lampton Secondary School are going to be giving a haunted 
tour of uh, forest here come up the first time ever event as far as I know uh, near the end of the event so um, or near the end of the month so if you uh, contact uh, North Lampton Secondary School I'm sure you get all the details from them so and the Petrolia Heritage also does a cemetery tour. Uh, they've already done their tour yet this year, but uh, you can stay tuned for next year. It's a really wonderful tour uh, that they do. So definitely check that out as well. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. The chat, everybody, uh, thank you so much. This has been some really great uh, chats that we've had tonight, very active, which is always awesome to see. Love it. So we are a few minutes over. So, um, oh, Elgin County is having their cemetery tours this Sunday. That's great. But I'll have to check that out. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, so on behalf of the Heritage Sarnia Lampton Museum Network, thank you everyone for attending tonight and continuing to support your local museums. Your support is critical in allowing us to continue preserving and sharing our local history and the stories of our community. We really hope to see you again during our next Heritage Hour talk um, in the upcoming year. So uh, stay tuned and I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.